Well now, who might you be? I'm the ghost of the money someone wasted on Flat Out 3! <laughs> yeah, we all saw that one. This bus? Why, it buries every specter of wasted money on awful racing games to their ultimate destination. The bottom bin, the great shrug, the place between live service and vaporware. Get in. I think this ride is gonna get mighty crowded. What are you in for? Me? I'm the ghost of the money wasted on? Yaris is an arcade-style racing game developed by Backbone Entertainment and Castaway Entertainment and released exclusively for Xbox 360 in 2007. This game is special. It was released for a limited time as a free download on Xbox Live Arcade, and since its limited release window lapsed, it is no longer available to download and play. Wait! A free game? That means it didn't waste anyone's money! Doesn't that mean this game gets a pass? Time is money! Don't you forget that! And money did go into this game, because it's not some generic throwaway freebie made on a whim. This is an advertisement, a specially funded project by vehicle manufacturer Toyota to advertise the Yaris, a model of car they pushed heavily during the mid-2000s. Yaris. Do you go places sometimes and leave places other times? Maybe you need a Yaris. It's a car. Ah, I, I believe the correct terminology for a game such as this would be <clears throat> advertainment. Who did Toyota slap behind the wheel of this whole Yaris project? Backbone Entertainment, a company featuring the talents of emulation and port powerhouse Digital Eclipse. And Castaway Entertainment, who was founded by a little company, used to be known as Blizzard North. Wait, creators of Diablo and Diablo 2? That Blizzard North? One and the same. Their new company was having massive financial troubles at the time and likely joined the Yaris project to fill the ever-increasing void in their pockets. Okay, right. We've got two teams with notable development connections making a game on the dime of a multi-billion dollar car company. How could they make a wrong turn? This! This is how. What the? Was that a tentacle growing out of a Yaris? Yes, it was. And at the tip, your gun that you fire out of your Yaris. Yaris, from Toyota. I'm sorry, a gun? In my Yaris? Yeah, we're on cruise control to confusion. A plain old racing game would have probably been the right way to go here. Showcase how fun the Yaris is to, I don't know, just drive? Other companies like Ford had done that years prior. They published a series of games called Ford Simulator. They showed off interesting facts about the cars and trucks, allowed you to customize them, and even simulated how they drove. Sure, by today's standards, this might look a little rough, but this was pretty advanced for its time. Right, right, so this Yaris game advertising the Yaris product, Yaris, from Toyota, doesn't actually allow you to experience said product, but instead is a hybrid style lap based third person shooter racing game with pop culture imagery set in a warped tunnel future world. How has this not created some weird, obsessed cult following? Because remember, the game was a limited release pulled years ago. Lucky for us, I downloaded it when it was live and kept it stashed away in a vault on my shadowy 360, secretly dipping in and playing it from time to time, laughing, laughing, and waiting for the day I'd show them all. I'd show them all! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Guess it has created a weird, obsessed cult following. So it was made, and it was pulled offline. Did it at least work as an advertisement for Yaris? Oh, hell no. This thing's wild. Just look at some of the characters, like Small Toaster. Jetpack Wabbits. UFO Wabbits. Buffed Up Saucer. Yeti Copter. Subwoofy. Bulldoggy. Owly. Green Minibike and Pink Minibike. Garbage Truck where this game belongs. And of course, how could I forget Ouroboros, a prolific symbol of a snake eating its own tail, symbolizing a never-ending battle, which is how you'll feel while playing the game. Uh, how do any of these characters help sell a car? Uh, 
They don't. Instead, you're supposed to shoot at them while driving. We go through a complex half-pipe system in one direction. You swing your car left and right while simultaneously aiming and blasting. To help you on your way, the game rocks a jerky camera that bumps around and struggles to keep your vehicle on screen properly. You know, exactly what you need when racing a car. And if that wasn't game-breakingly distracting enough, your score, pickups, and combos are confirmed with generic green text that constantly litters the screen. Enemies attack you from all over, around you, from behind you, anywhere and everywhere. Some even leave curiously unanimated fire trails that hurt you if you drive into them. All while you traverse repetitive, poorly designed, bland stages. The handling sucks. Look at this. The car barely leaves the track, even when the road has sudden extreme dips. The RS awkwardly pops around as it clings to the floor. I don't know that the word momentum ever came up in the game's design notes. You're a stiff, glidey paperweight with a clumsy matrix tentacle for offense. Gameplay out of the way. What really grinds the gear shift here is that you need to play a bunch of levels to get Toyota coins to buy different models of the Yaris. Look, with a game this shoddy whose main purpose is to advertise a product, you'd better be dang sure that anyone with even a passing interest in a certain model of your car has access to said model. Uh, if someone's interested in playing a game starring, say, the brand new Toyota Yaris four-door sedan, available at your local Toyota dealership. Don't hide it behind a replay-centric unlock system. Not when your consumer will be driven away after a single lap in a version of a car they weren't interested in in the first place. So it's safe to assume very few people people would likely play this thing long enough to get the full experience or see the gigantic spider gas pump boss. Clearly, this was a failure of advertainment. I don't imagine it convinced anyone to buy a Yaris. Uninspired and frantic gameplay, a mess of visual oddities, a vehicle that controls like an icy tree stump. Pass. Boss pass. I'm off cars. The only thing designed worse than this game is where they put the speedometer inside of a Yaris. It's in the center. Why is it in the sense? As for the two developers behind this game, well, Backbone Entertainment, through multiple acquisitions and changes, became Digital Eclipse once again. And Castaway Entertainment? Yeah, they closed down, having only made this one title. They seemingly popped the clutch and never got a chance to turn the ignition on another project. I can also double as the ghost of the money you wasted on buying a real Toyota Yaris. I've got range. Range? Let me tell you about range. How about a game that reached thousands of people? A game that folks had but never knew existed. A game put together by some of the most successful minds in tech ever. I'm Donkey is a racing game developed by Neil Konzin and Bill Gates for IBM's first personal computer in 1981. Wait, not that Bill Gates. You might wonder what I'm doing here. Oh yeah, that Bill Gates. <laughs> At the dawn of the 80s, Microsoft was helping develop an operating system and programming language for IBM's brand spanking new line of personal computers. IBM was looking to compete in a home computer market saturated by competitors like the iconic Apple II and Atari's 8-bit line. While building system software to help IBM compete, Bill Gates and Neil Konzen wrote a program seemingly overnight in a closet. No, literally, in a closet. This program was developed specifically to flex the pecs of their up-and-coming operating software. Now, without diving into the wild world of computer history, all you need to know is that at this time, Atari's machines were capable of doing this. And Apple's could do this. Both visually impressive for their time. Donkey! On the other hand, look like this. <laughs> yes! This game has you driving a car, switching lanes, avoiding, let's be honest, far too many donkeys. The donkeys are all scattered and frozen on a single straight road. Your car slowly moves up to the edge of the screen until you win or lose a round. Rinse and repeat for infinity. Now, to be fair, we did say this was developed overnight. And in a closet. So we can forgive that this plays only moderately better than Yaris. The speedometer is in the center. But look at the visuals, the lack of color. Aside from a very inconsistent dividing line animation in the center of the road, there are no other animations. Visually, it's just so bleh. And the audio? 
hurts. The entire game is controlled by pressing the space bar to switch lanes on the road. No speeding up or slowing down. One button is all it takes to play this game. And you'd think a game this basic wouldn't have any problems at all. But somehow it does. A big unavoidable problem. When you switch lanes too quickly near a donkey, even if you obviously couldn't have hit the donkey, you'll hit the damn donkey. The hit detection seems to be fine in front of our four-legged friend, but it's way off behind the hooked beast. Such a simple flaw shouldn't be that big of an issue, but when the only thing you do in the game is switch lanes, this stands out. Imagine a game of Pong where your paddle lets the ball travel right through it from time to time. It's inexcusable. Simple games cannot have big issues, because if they do, it's all you'll ever see when you play it. But we hear what you're saying. Guys, this couldn't have possibly been sold. Nobody would actually distribute this to public, especially not Papa IBM or Mama Microsoft. They have an image to maintain. I exist. Donkey found its way into homes. Hey guys, what's up? In fact, IBM PCs at the time came bundled with Donkey. You could show people how awesome your new $1,565 IBM was, one avoided Donkey at a time. That's around mm, $5,000 adjusted for inflation. Five grand, and you got a Donkey game made overnight in a closet that probably didn't have windows? Now, I'm sure you're all thinking we're being harsh on a game from so long ago. But why listen to us complain about it when you can listen to someone who actually bought one of these PCs at the time? One of the many proud owners? Steve Jobs, then CEO of Apple, who brought it into work for his employees to tear down and study. Andy Hertzfeld, one of the key architects of the Macintosh operating system, was on hand to witness this would-be rival's attack at the Apple empire. He had choice words about Donkey. The most embarrassing game was a low-res graphics driving game called Donkey. The player was supposed to be driving a car down a slowly scrolling, poorly rendered road and could hit the space bar to toggle the jerky motion. Every once in a while, a brown blob would fill the screen, which was supposed to be a donkey manifesting in the middle of the road. If you didn't hit the space bar in time, you would crash into the donkey and lose the game. We were amazed that such a thoroughly bad game could be co-authored by Microsoft's co-founder. Ouch! Sounds less like Donkey turned consumers to buy an IBM, and more like it turned its creators into... Yeah, and whatever happened to Bill Gates? I think he bounced back. But one could only imagine how much more successful Bill Gates would have been had he developed Donkey 2, another on the road. Don't you give anyone ideas now! Nobody would willingly play that! Speaking of racing games nobody would willingly want to play, Spirit of Speed 1937 is a racing game developed by Broadsword Interactive Limited and published by LJN for the PC in 1999 and the Sega Dreamcast in the year 2000. While this was the first game Broadsword ever developed, for LJN, this would be the last game the company would ever release. LJN has a long storied history of quality that is is questionable and widely discussed online. Despite the fact that LJN never developed a single video game, some folks really dislike anything with this logo. But shockingly, their early roots publishing contentious NES titles didn't quite kill off the company, allowing them to limp their way to the edge of the new millennium. Now, while LJN was a multicolored husk anticipating a death knell in 2000, Broadsword Interactive would go on to develop games for the next decade. So it's one company's last game and another company's first. Was it bad enough to put LJN out of its misery? Was it good enough to propel Broadsword to more solid software creation? To answer these important questions, we must first explain what this game is. As you probably figured out from the title, Spirit of Speed 1937 is a racing game that takes place in 1937. And like in any good racing game, it offers players plenty of tracks to race with a whole stack of vehicles to choose from. Unfortunately, no matter which vehicle you pick, the only spirit you're gonna awaken is a spirit of pain. In this game, every car drives like a bathtub with some wheels nailed to it. Steering is, how do we put this? 
not reliable. And hey, maybe that's accurate for the time period. Uh, maybe all of these vehicles really were frustratingly fickle back then. But if that's the case, why make a game about it? There's not a heck of a lot going on in these stages. They're inspired by real tracks, but don't really do those spaces justice. Look at how sparse this is. These locations do sport one thing, though. A variety of turns. Even 90-degree ones. <laughs> Thing the game doesn't provide you with a map or any suggestion as to the path you're hurling yourself through. No HUD directional arrows, no helpful signage anywhere of any kind. Again, maybe this encompasses exactly how these races were in 1937, but it still makes for a horrible playing experience. I have no idea where I'm going! Oh, good God, the humanity! I'm hitting a wall! Unfortunately, with stiff controls and baffling design choices, every race feels slow, awkward to navigate, and about as tantalizing as licking a windshield clean. A racing game has one primary job, making said races fun and interesting. But here, it almost feels like you... Did the car just stop? Uh, I can still turn, but I can't seem to do anything else. What the heck happened? Cars don't just come to a standstill unless they break down or run out of gas. Oh, and it got such good gas mileage. Oh, look, there's a fuel meter, a working one right on the dashboard. Guess we should have been paying attention to that. Turns out this isn't an arcade style racer like Daytona USA. Daytona! Or San Francisco Rush. San Francisco! Nope, it turns out the game steers more towards realism. A sim racer. Your car takes damage, it stops working. Your car runs out of gas, it stops moving. You can bring up an on-screen HUD to check all these stats. Uh, gas, damage, Oil? It actually has a working oil gauge? Realism! The game tries to simulate real-world aspects while failing to be faithful where it counts. Remember the driving issues we talked about? The flow of the road not being telegraphed? The awful handling? Well, guess what this means? You crash. A lot. And banging up your vehicle leads to this. The most unrealistic looking physics imaginable. Your car looks like a freaking pinball bouncing around the field. And when two vehicles collide, it looks and feels like they didn't. How did the wires get so crossed here? Seriously, these physics feel like a full blown curse while you're racing. Any tiny bump leads to a super jostle spin that usually lands you behind your competitors. And that's if, if you can match or surpass their speed in the first place. Look, we're not early motor speed sport history buffs. I think everyone can tell that by now. Cars go? Yes. We don't claim to know anything about any vehicle's performances or handling. But if this is actually how these cars worked? Good gravy. With that out of the way, we gotta talk about the balancing in this game. We understand that certain vehicles from certain manufacturers are naturally faster than others, but this game has a mixed power lineup competing from the very first race. Right, there doesn't seem to be a class system limiting what machines are entered into what race. And why is this so bad? Well, because that means that by choosing some cars in this roster, you basically lose before the race has even begun. Some racers instantly launch out at the beginning of a race, quickly becoming a speck in the distance. And of course, any attempt to get up to speed is in vain. Put the pedal to the metal all you want, but you still don't psychically know how the road will weave and the handling doesn't handle. The only way to win is to cheat, cutting paths that would typically punish the player in other games. But it doesn't. Look, I'm driving off the concrete into the dirt. This should result in a spin out or some sort of penalty, but it doesn't. Any win like this feels completely unearned. But don't worry, the game is equally unfair to you too. Like here, a destroyed car in the center of the road. In a real race, they would have pulled this car to the side, rescued the driver, or at the very least, you know, Done something. Not here, though. Not in this sim racer. No. Instead, you have a giant obstacle that can and will destroy your car if you make contact. And if not for you, for the other racers that are playing. 
Cars get damaged all the time and leave drivers stranded on the road. Heck, even you can be the obstacle. Remember how we kind of ran out of gasoline? Well, the game doesn't instantly end. You stick around like the huge, embarrassing paperweight you are until you force quit the race. Even your opponents can run out of precious, precious fuel. Here, we were stuck on the road and suddenly felt a large shove forward. Turned out a car hit us from behind and also ran out of gas at the exact same spot we did. And they slowly, slowly slide down the track. Nice. Oh no, more cars! Brace for impact! Pile up! Wait, hey, they didn't run out of gas? The driver just couldn't comprehend how to get around me? A stationary object? Guess it needed a jump start. A collision jump start. No, you can't have a racer that leans heavily into simulation alongside AI drivers that have the mental fortitude of a box of cornflakes. These two things don't mix. So not only is this game terrible to play, it's also terrible to watch as the AI makes a mockery of the sport. A sport Shane and I love. We absolutely do. It's with the cars. I think with the four wheels. How Broadsword walked away from this heap to produce many more games after it? A mystery. But as for LJN, yeah, this was the proverbial <laughs> nail in the coffin. They didn't go out with a bang. They went out with a sp <laughs> sp <laughs> sp <laughs> sputter. Sputter. Oh boy, the cars in that game look identical to the one in Donkey. They certainly control the same. Six plus six equals 12. Ah! Ah! You can't just jump out and do numbers at people. 12 minus nine equals three. Seriously, what's this guy's deal? Does he need help? Oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. I know him. He's got a sad history with numbers. That poor sucker's the ghost of... Math Grand Prix is a racing game developed by Atari and released for the Atari 2600 in 1982. Wow. Oh, besides that uh, donkey game we covered, this might be the earliest console game we've ever talked about on the show. You're right! Math Grand Prix was released just a year after Donkey. Huh, so what's it like? Well, it appears to be a racing game in which you solve math problems to make your vehicle travel along the track, and you input those math problem solutions with a single joystick and one button. <sighs> So, this is a big pilot. It's pretty bad. 16 minus seven equals nine! Ah! If I was involved in a game that bad, I'd probably lose the ability to speak as well. Tragic, old timer ghosts, sad state of affairs, like all the money lost on bad Nintendo Entertainment System games. Did someone say bad Nintendo Entertainment System games? Is every ghost on this bus listening in on this conversation? You gotta be kidding me! Mm -hmm. I'm the... Monster Truck Rally is a racing game developed by Real Time Associates and published by... Here, hmm... Intiv Corp? Int... It was released for the NES in 1991. Real Time Associates have a long history of game development. They created games like Bug, as well as titles based on popular intellectual properties like Beavis and Butthead on the SNES and... Ah! Real monsters. Funny thing, Real Time Associates name doesn't appear anywhere to let you know they worked on the game. But this, Intiv Corp, Intiv Corp, whatever, it seems to be everywhere. Hmm, I've never heard of Intiv before, but that font seems awfully familiar. Hey, wait a second. Intellivision Corporation. Corporation. Well, that's strange. Another console manufacturer releasing games on a competing platform? Why did they switch out their own name? According to my lightning quick research, Intev Corporation wasn't really in television. Mattelatronics, who owned Intellivision, sold off its assets in 1984 to leave what they likely assumed was the doomed video game market. Oh, no future in them strange video game thingers. Hey, you can tell! Once they were out of the console business, the folks that ended up buying the scraps formed a new group called Intev Corporation, which went out of business in 1991. Wait, when did we say this game came out? 1991. Hmm, this game is gonna hurt, isn't it? Oh, it'll hurt. Even the music hurts. Sounds like a rat's choking on a balloon. I'm trying to cut back, but my doctor says I need to at least have three balloons a day. <laughs> Right, but the gameplay. How is the gameplay? Only one way to find out. 
Let's start up a mud-filled drag race with three other trucks. This ought to be fun. And go. This is, this is really, really like ultra stupid, crazy slow. I could do my taxes before this truck finishes the race. Oh, hold on. What? Are we getting lapped in a drag race? That's how slow we're going. We're breaking the fragile concepts of space and time. Oh, look. They've already finished and are now acting as obstacles. Looks like the spirit of speed from 1937 is still alive in 1991. This is insulting. We're now just going through the motions to officially lose the race. Nothing I seem to be doing is making the car go slower or faster. It's perpetually stuck at this speed. And with a new record for world's slowest driver. Us. It's us. Yeah. This is so stupid. Every time we race, it always seems like the other trucks are faster than ours. Oh, you have no idea. At first, this might seem like a by the numbers truck racing game, but it doesn't play the way you think it would. Like with your car's transmission. In other racing games, if your vehicle wasn't automatic and had multiple gears to shift through, you'd likely use an input on the controller to trigger that function. So if you drove left and right with a D-pad, up and down could be how you change gears. But that's not what's going on here. See, to change gears, you need to hold the acceleration button, release it briefly, and tap and hold it down again. And do this a few times. It's the most unreliable and confusing way to change gears in a game ever. But that free input on the controller. Why didn't they just use up or down on the D-pad? Uh -huh. Great. The confusion keeps on trucking when you see the larger levels. Oh, what are we even looking at here? This is an isometric perspective showing you the rise and dips in stage topography. Only with this very specific angle they chose, it cuts directly on the corners of certain hills, meaning that you can't see the freaking hills? Yeah, isn't this just the most headache inducing? There are obstacles to avoid, harsh turns to take, and much more that all has to be done while correctly timing out your gear changing taps to accelerate. So more often than not, you'll be stuck in situations like this. Come on, come on, get up the hill, move! At least we can blame this design on it being an NES release. Maybe they didn't know better. Uh, I wouldn't be quick to say that. RC Pro-Am and Super Off-Road were both released on the NES earlier than this. Both featured complicated level designs, but with some very smart points. RC Pro-Am does feature a similar viewpoint, yes, but direction arrows for upcoming turns and a mini-map at the bottom help guide you along your way. Monster Truck Rally misses both of these things. It's like being stuck in a maze. And Super Off-Road has a shockingly similar game premise, but they pulled the camera way back so that you could easily view the whole stage. To add to the gameplay complexity and variation, RC Pro-Am features pickups on the tracks that upgrade and improve your vehicle, and Super Off-Road features a more robust system utilizing in-game winnings to purchase additional upgrades. Monster Truck Rally features nothing like that. Well, it does have a track builder, but uh, do you really want to make tracks that look like this? No thanks. They tried to offer different game types to spice up the gameplay and Monster Truck Rally, but it all just fails. Car Crush, where you crush cars. Sled Pull, where you pull a sled. Tug of War, where two trucks drive in opposite directions with a rope attaching them. Don't get excited, I did. There's no donuts. You're just driving in circles. But because the core game design and graphics are so very, very bad, every mode is, without a doubt, a monster mess to play. It's shocking that by 1991, after all the other racers we saw, they designed something that feels so much older than its contemporaries. Well, they kind of didn't. What if I told you this game goes by a totally different name and was released on a totally different console years before? Oh no, nope. There's no way anyone, anyone in their right mind would do that. Nope. Stadium Mud Buggies is a racing game developed by Real Time Associates and published by Intev Corp and released for the Intellivision in 1989. No way! Yup. 
Released a few years earlier, the game features similar gameplay with more simplified graphics due to the console it was released on. When compared to the NES, this game looks much, much older. So you're telling me this is basically a port of a game that they decided to completely change the name of? Wouldn't this confuse any fans of the original game? Oh yeah, if you had bought that game and wanted a better looking version, you can call this better, you might have never known this NES release existed. The title doesn't even have the word truck in it. It's buggies. For casual folks, they probably think of an actual dune buggy like this before they think of a truck. This is stupid. Why would Intellivision do this? Gosh, there are so many bad racing games out there I didn't even know about. Makes me wonder how many good racing games actually exist. Sup, losers? You talking good racing games? I represent one of those puppies. A good game? W why are you on this bus? Who are you? Chill, daddy-o. Let me tell you about a little game called... Race Driving is an arcade racing game developed by Atari Games and released in 1990. Uh, okay, I've played Race Driving. Race Driving is good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are the clouds parting? Are we talking about just good games now? We could, but today we're not focusing on the arcade version of this game. Oh, is it the DOS version? That one's pretty great too. Okay, yeah, uh, nice to know that you know the other versions, but we're gonna go a, a little bit deeper than that. Well, whatever platform it's on, it can't be that bad. A good game in arcades properly ported to home PCs? I'm confident that this is gonna be... How many frames per second is that? Two plus two! I'm the ghost of the money wasted on the Super Nintendo version of Race Driving. Oh, I knew you were full of shit with those Ray Bans! If the game was running this bad, why would you release it? Wouldn't you go, oh dang, looks like we're having problems optimizing this for the SNES. Shut it down, folks! We done! Yeah, you'd think that, but that's not what happened. As you can imagine, playing this game is pretty harsh, especially if you have access to the far superior PC version. Okay, it's bad. I get that. But the PC was the PC. Many systems at the time were more capable of running something like this than the SNES. It's not a fair competition. I agree! Let's compare it with the Game Boy release. Oh, sure. Why not? <laughs> what does it run at? Negative two frames per... Oh, my. Yeah. This is... Yeah. That is... Yup. The game has a higher frame rate on the Game Boy? Madness! Not madness, reality. Race Driving on the Game Boy was developed by a different company than the SNES version. It was made by Argonaut Software, the same insanely talented people who made X, another 3D style game on the Game Boy. But most people would probably know this group for having a hand in the Super FX chip, which was utilized in groundbreaking titles like Star Fox. But for the people who bought the SNES release, believing it to be better than a portable version, they got this. Less frames than a broken slideshow. Wait, I got an idea. We can fix this. Just a second. There! Bingo! Race driving, running on an SNES with a manageable frame rate. I mean, it's the Game Boy version, but still. But the curse has been lifted. I'm free. Look, look, guys. Really, I'm ascending. Here I go. embodiment of the money wasted on the crappy Super Nintendo version, not the better Game Boy release, right? Should you tell him or should I? Hey! You're still trash! What? Oh, crap! Look, everybody, it's pretty clear to me now that if you're on this bus, you're here for a reason. We're all equally bad. <laughs> Currently scratching the glass, but I have got no fingers to make use of it, so just envision in your mind's eye what that might sound like. Y'all don't know me, or know how I came to be. I'll share in your conversations, but it ain't gonna be easy. Bad game. Not like going down to the store and buying a disc or cartridge on a whim. My game? Swallow you whole. Little glitching, little crashing, and down you go. Oh, I'll tell you, me game. 
But once you've heard me tell, you won't be speaking of bad games here and there. You don't know what I know. You haven't seen what I've seen. But if you're willing to hear it, my game, I'll give you the developers, the tale, the whole damn experience. Big Rigs Over the Road Racing is... Eh... Is what? Infamous. Yeah, that's an understatement. Big Rigs Over the Road Racing is a game developed by Stellar Stone and released exclusively for PC in 2003. Considered by many to be the worst racing game ever made in the history of the medium. We can't tell you much about the folks who made this game, but what we do know is that they had dabbled in different genres, having created a bunch of games prior to Big Rigs. A pinball game. A Civil War game. A deer hunting game. And a crazy taxi clone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, we played them all, folks, and believe us, they're rotten the whole lot. We could spend days going over each game, talking about why they're bad, but one game they developed seems to have taken the trash crown for the worst they've done. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there used to be a bunch of retail stores that would sell single jewel case PC games on racks. Just tons of these things, varying degrees of quality throughout. And if the two of us had to guess, that's what these games from Stellar Stone were probably made for. Quickly produced with no regard for quality whatsoever. None of them stand out, but that taxi racer game they made, that's important. It tells us that the devs like to iterate on other game formulas. The Crappily. Now to those in the know, this game obviously takes Sega's beloved arcade classic Crazy Taxi. Hey, hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi. And poorly, poorly squeezes out the game's ideas into a dreadful puddle of knockoff. It's a stripped down, much worse version that doesn't even try to have a rockin' soundtrack. Hey, hey, come on over, have some fun with Sad Taxi Game. This leads us to believe that Big Rigs, this other game they made, might be the developer's attempt at making their own version of Sega's 18-wheeler American Pro Trucker. But that's only a guess. Because outside of the games they've developed, we don't know much about Stellar Stone. What we can tell you is that the company was small, likely less than 10 people in the studio at the time. All credits for all their games are mostly the same. And Big Rig's credit screen has nine individuals listed in total. Now, the size of a team is never an indicator of overall game quality. Small teams can make great games, and large teams can also make mm. awful ones. But Big Rig's, oh, friends, it's a signature disaster. As you might guess, races have you taken control of rigs. Big ones. You get to choose from a very limited number of them. But no matter what you pick, none of the trucks handle differently. They may look unique, but they all steer like they're made up of a floating pile of bricks. Oh, do they got weight to them. And they turn terribly and feel super stiff. This doesn't look right. Yeah, it's strange. Typically a vehicle would sway a bit in a turn, but here, every vehicle remains rigid as it barrels through the levels. And levels, oh, these stages, folks, they're not done. You can clearly see broken textures on the asphalt that blink in and out of existence. It happens all the time, all over the place. The heads-up display, just as busted. Numbers jut out of the graphical boundaries when you begin a race, like it was done on purpose. And that's if you knew the race started in the first place. Aside from the sound of what we assume is an engine, there isn't much else here. No lights or starting sound. No race countdown, no music, nothing. As soon as the race begins, the word ready just appears on the screen and that's it. They forgot to tell you to go in a racing game. Your opponent in each race is always one vehicle. And it, as far as we can tell, it has a hard coded race pattern. It's not AI. They seem to drive the exact same way at the same speed and direction on each level. Both you and your competitor need to hit ultranav checkpoints. That little bar on your HUD. But don't worry about losing the race if you miss one and then have to double back and catch it. Yeah, it's not a problem. We couldn't lose. And we tried.
your winner. Your winner! As far as we can tell, Big Rigs has no losing screen. So no matter how bad you drive or how late you make it to the finish line, you'll always win. Your winner! We tried different game modes to see if they resolve this, like the random race option from the main menu. But when we started that up, the entire level disappeared. So, uh, no help there. But fine. Vehicles handle like crap. Your opponent is a cut and paste recording. Game modes are broken. And you can't lose. Your winner. At the very, very least, the act of driving your vehicle and avoiding hitting obstacles must provide some minor enjoyable challenge. Right? <laughs> yeah. But no. In 3D video games, typically, models and levels, like buildings, are designated with boundaries. You've definitely seen it before. If your character runs runs into a wall, the wall stops your character from moving forward. You know, like real life. Well, this game, they didn't do that. Oh, well, that's impossible. Oh, you think. Every single building, every single object is completely ethereal. You may drive through anything and everything. So monumentally stupid. Worst off, this includes bridges. Your vehicle will fly through, driving underneath them while your camera stays on top of the bridge somehow. And your opponent? They can drive right through you. Because none of this really matters. Because matter doesn't matter, apparently. This, this is just... Why didn't they fix this before release? I have no idea, but here it is in all of its glory, but it gets worse. No. How could it get worse than this? Well, see, the trucks themselves, they seem to be designed in a way where they have constant momentum. If you drove up a cliff in any other racing game, your vehicle would slow down a bit to compensate, since it's hard for a vehicle to go up a hill and all. Gravity, we call it. We're all familiar with it. Well, in this game, that doesn't happen. You just drive off, max speed, flail it around like the hill is nothing. Oh, and did we mention they forgot to make any boundaries at all for the levels? This, this right here, this is impressively bad. I've played games where you could get through the invisible walls on a level, like a fun way to try and break the game. But here, it's not even a challenge. Just drive in any direction for a few seconds and bam, instant Outworld. With all this, I think it's easy to see why so many people have actually played this game. Not because it was good. Oh, no, no, no. Far from that. Because it was the terrible racing game. A while back, we called Flat Out 3 the worst racing game. In that game, you had to play it to progress. It's a game. But Big Rigs, it's just more like a free-moving obstacle experience, I think. But at the very least, we can say with confidence that Big Rigs stands alone. The team at this point knew they weren't making a positive splash in the world of gaming. Clearly. With that knowledge, the developers would never attempt to create another video game ever again. <coughs> you know, by the end of that game, it became known by all, pulled in hundreds of reviewers. I don't know how many more played it, maybe thousands. I don't know why, but they played all they could stomach and walked away with a fancy video to show their friends. Had a laugh they did. They'd beat it, they'd say, but it weren't done. No, I kept a secret in me, something deep down. Everyone looks at that Big Riggs and don't have the foggiest, because what nobody knew, not a one of you, that Big Riggs had a sequel. Oh! Midnight Race Club Supercharged is another racing game developed by Stellar Stone and released exclusively for PC in 2004. Just... <laughs> I mean, you can't do that, right? You can't make big rigs and turn around and make a sequel to that game, right? How could they do that? Did they not learn? Did they not bear witness to their own errors? Well, uh, hold on. Take solace. This is Stellar Stone's final title. And unlike their previous racer, the title of this last game had obvious inspiration, Midnight Club Street Racing. Keep in mind that while we say the title is inspired by that game, the game itself totally isn't. Now let's give you a moment to breathe. No doubt you're shocked to learn a sequel exists to this. 
And while you might expect that some advancement in games creation has happened between Stellar Stone's titles, either on the skill side or the tech side, well, prepare to be shocked once more. We'll give them a positive note. Most of the 3D objects in the game world now have boundaries. Good gosh, one would never expect such a thing to be real. But it is very real. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because... Uh, wait, no. Oh, the rest of the game. Is this just Big Rigs again? Oh, what were you expecting? A new game? This is Stellar Stone, my fellow tarnished. You shall not be impressed. And that there's my secret, chums. Not that there is another Big Rigs game. It's that they released the same game twice. There's only one of me, for a reason. Every single level from the original game is replicated right here in full. Barely anything, anything has changed. And by the way, one of these very, very few levels is just a replicated version of an earlier level, but backwards. And because 3D models have boundaries now, instead of driving through hard to see streetlights as you could in big rigs, <laughs> You whack right into them. And there's no physics for any of these objects. So even if you hit something as minor as, let's say a street cone, stop dead in your tracks. Yeah, somehow adding one tiny fix to their messy driving game means that levels are now even less playable than they were before. Brilliant. All the vehicles you can choose, no matter if they're a car or a motorcycle, they all handle exactly the same. And when we say they handle the same, we don't mean they all feel like cars. We mean they all feel like big rigs. They've switched out the truck models with these new ones and made no other modifications. Seriously, look, you can see the original taillights for the big rig trucks right there. Remember how poorly those handled all that weight? Well, now this nimble looking motorcycle moves the exact same way. You'd hope for some improvement, but even the strange model glitches in the first game, like this untextured streetlight, is replicated one to one. They tried to pass this off as a brand new game and didn't even bother to fix this one glaring issue you see right at the start of the race. This is breathtakingly lazy. Still don't believe that this is just a reskinned, barely bandited big rigs? Here, we found this. Since random race mode broke on us when we first tried it in big rigs, we thought we'd give it a shot in Midnight Race Club. And when you do that, guess what happens? The game should randomize a stage and vehicle from Midnight Race Club. You know, any of these. But instead, you get a truck from Big Rigs. They didn't even remove the truck models from this game. Oh, pretty sure that means that while the studio was pumping out this little title at the speed of freaking light, they didn't even test the random race function on the main menu. Or you know what? Maybe they were completely aware. Maybe they saw all of this and didn't care. Look, can we call this a sequel? It's a model swap with different textures and words on the main menu. Besides a little, what, collision detection? <laughs> Nothing is different. Even that broken bridge you could drive through is still busted. But now that you can't simply drive through 3D models, your vehicle suddenly gets stuck on the bridge. Hold on, looks like they may have made one more adjustment. Going up the hill provides some minor resistance now, but it's sort of broken. It arbitrarily activates at random times on all stages. Great, the awful driving gets worse. Ah, but at least with objects having boundaries now, the levels can finally prevent the player from driving off-road into the... No, oh, no, I guess they skipped that fix. But with all that, we need to talk about the one thing both of these games have. A passed over glitch. One glaring mistake that was never fixed. Perhaps this was never an issue because the designers of these titles figured no one really needed to reverse in a racing game. But check this out. <laughs> Momentum forward has a slowly gained limit. You can only go so fast, but reverse. Well, friends, there's no limit.
Combine this with edgeless levels and the game begins to fold in on itself. To the bottom left, the developers have kindly left their positioning stats on the screen. This way you can see exactly where your vehicle is on the stage at any given moment. But if you hold down reverse and wait for a really long time, your speed will build to places we never assumed possible. Wait, what the heck? There's nothing out here. Where did the world go? What is this place? And we're here. Everyone out. Where is here? End of the line, bucko. Jeez, there's so many. How many more are gonna show up? Depends. When do you think those idiots will stop reviewing bad games? <laughs> We've looked through our fair share today. And while the extreme lack of quality in Big Rigs and Midnight Race Club Supercharged has us scratching our heads as to whether these disasters even qualify as racing games, we can easily say that our time with these two titles was absolute misery. But if we had to choose which one was worse, ugh. Well, I think we'd have to go with Midnight Race Club. Yeah, Big Rigs was a busted experience in a lot of ways, but in the end, we could play every level and drive every vehicle in the game. Midnight Race Club, on the other hand, is not only a sloppy mess to play, but it has one special vehicle that, when selected, will hard crash your game every time guaranteed. See? Big Rigs didn't have that problem. Don't know why it happens, but it's more than enough to crown this game worse than Big Rigs. Congrats, Midnight Race Club. We hate you. We tasted a bunch of different flavors of terrible racing titles today, and through all those gnarly skid marks and potholes and somehow arithmetic and donkeys, we actually found commonality. Yup, they all share that rush of anguish and disdain you get from playing them. That burning, nitrous-infused loathing that will skid three words out of your face at top speed. 